Oh, yeah. Um, okay, this is, um, the COBITUS was um, um, started in mid-2014, uh, um, an OHBM council statement on neuroimaging research, and it's quite interesting from the standpoint that it's the first time really an organization looked at defining best practices and then putting it to the vote to the entire membership, which you can see in um, last summer, um, OHBM put a vote of 153 to 6 to approve this document. And this was a, a joint effort and a number of individuals um, in which I'm going to present kind of the summary of findings. But it's also, it went out to the community. So the community made comments and the committee changed things based on the OHBM community. But then you ask the question, why create such a document? Well, there's been um, a number of papers, um, including uh, the Eklund paper that came up recently. Um, this one was in 2005 um, by John Ioannidis, that, um, who is an epidemiologist and I actually work um, in population, pediatric population neuroscience. So I interact quite a bit with um, epidemiologists. Um, but his statement and paper was why most published research findings are false. Um, some, some people, when I describe this, will say, of course he's, he's, he's Greek. That's a Greek tragedy. You would expect such a thing. Um, but I think um, there's truth in what he says, um, that there's many um, published research findings. I won't say it's true or false. I think we live more in a world of continuums and grays. And so most published research findings do have bits of truth. But there are, um, in, I, I think, you know, with all the papers in neuroimaging that are coming out, if they were all true, um, we should be a lot farther along than what we are now. So what is it in his paper that he describes? So um, I don't have a pointer, but I'm going to point out a couple things. And, and this is one of his tables where he shows some practical examples of positive predictive value for various combinations of power. So that's um, one over the um, false negative rate. Um, and R, which is kind of a nebulous um, variable that he has in, in his uh, equation for um, showing the pulse um, positive predictive value. So R is really, what R is in his studies are how many true findings are there compared to how many findings that are be, being tested in the literature. So in, in essence, how many hypotheses are you testing? And of those hypotheses, how, much are, how many are true compared to how many are false? And then U, which is um, uh, the third uh, column, is bias. And I'm going to be going into bias more in depth and giving you some real life examples the good, the bad, and the ugly, some from my own work and work of my uh, group. Um, but just to give you some examples, if you have an adequately powered randomized control trial, this is the top one, uh, with 80% power, um, the R value, so the number of hypotheses that you're testing is actually two. One is true, one is false. Um, and there's very little bias no bias is zero, then you have a positive predictive value of um, 0.85. If you go down the list to, um, let's say, discovery-oriented exploratory research with massive testing, and you have large amounts of bias there, which is 0.8, you're testing multiple hypotheses, and you're underpowered, then your positive predictive value drops way down um, to 0.001. So um, with this in mind um, and moving forward and looking at, at bias, the COBIDIS was covering best practices in a number of different areas. And I um, decided the best way to kind of conceptualize um, this is to go through each of these and, and give you uh, essentially the top 10 or 10 practical points um, for when you're working on papers to try and uh, apply the best standards. But really, the key factor that I think we came up with is, is just describing what you do and, and letting, because we can't 
designate what the best practices are in every area, but we, what we can do is describe the best practices for reporting those findings, so just being transparent. So here's 10 good tips for uh, good reporting and data sharing um, that'll cover areas of reproducibility, replication, and how to understand um, the results generalizing to different populations. So tip one is to provide enough information for the reader to understand potential bias in your study. And I think one of the works of, uh, one of the points really, the key points of Ioannidis, I, th I think it's an excellent paper to read, is how bias can really influence um, your results. So this is demographics and clinical confounding, and the best time to think about uh, reducing potential biases during the design of your study. So I'm going to critique some of my own work here. So I want you to look at, this was published in Biological Psychiatry in 2006, and if you look at, if I'm going to um, ask you to focus on intelligence testing, the lower three columns, and, and look at Adolescent patients, these are patients with schizophrenia versus adolescent control subjects. You can see the full scale IQ for adolescent patients is 91. Full scale IQ for the adolescent controls is 114. So this looks to me like there's um, considerable bias here in um, comparing apples, potentially apples and oranges. Um, you look at the verbal and performance, you see a huge difference. The normal IQ is 100. Um, but then look at the parental education level and the, or the paternal and the maternal education levels, because this is not so clear cut, because um, schizophrenia, um, as many of you know, is associated with a cognitive decline. So if you start controlling for intelligence, you're controlling also for a part of the illness as well. So they're actually very well matched on paternal and maternal education level. So there's no clear-cut answer here. Often what I do is uh, present um, both with and without a co varying for something like IQ. But these are issues of potential bias. But I think the point here is that the reader can then look and say, oh, this is potentially a bias or or perhaps not, because they're controlled by um, paternal and maternal IQ. <clears throat> so what different types of bias are there? I, I showed you a potential example of selection bias, where individuals are more likely to be selected than others. And there's some groups in which it's much more difficult um, to get good matching uh, control groups. Um, so we were trying to recruit um, lower SES individuals and that was, it was very difficult. Reporting bias, um, certain observations are more commonly reported than others. Analytic bias, I'm gonna show you an example of that. Then there's exclusion bias, those in um, uh, systematic exclusion of certain individuals. Those of us who are involved in longitudinal studies have to deal with attrition bias, oftentimes the most the people we most want to study are those that um, seem to drop out of the studies. Uh, funding bias, um, studies that show 97% um, or 95% of the industry-sponsored um, studies support the drug of the study. And then there's the, always the career propagation bias, playing with data until you come up with a positive result. So let me ask you a question. So do darker skin players receive more red cards? So I live overseas now in Rotterdam, so I've been learning a lot about, learning some about soccer. I still have a lot to learn though. Um, but this seems like a relatively straightforward question, yes or no. But um, this data was given to 29 different groups, one data set, um, many analysis and, and kind of a looking at how uh, different groups, and you can see that, um, so the, you can see equally likely, there were, there were several studies that showed equally likely, twice as likely, most of the studies were in between, and the red indicates those that were significant and um, the clear were not significant. And there were set two groups which, um, although the, uh, the error bars were extremely large, 
had um, close to three times the rates of um, darker skinned individuals receiving more red cards. So where does this difference uh, come from? And, and one of the areas where, mainly area where it comes, is, um, is in which covariates that are chosen to enter into the model. So you can, you can in essence, do beautiful um, data analysis, and then you have to make some decisions on what potentially confounding variables that you want to include in your model and why. So, so for example, 67% or 62% chose to position of the person because I think a, a goalie um, is much less likely to get a red card than other positions. Um, height, weight, age, league, country. So different groups chose different covariates and that changed the results um, to some extent. What's the, the, the true effect is unclear, but this raises the question, what if we were to send our data to several different labs and say, okay, analyze our data and see if you come up with uh, something that's similar. I noticed there's actually one um, covariate on here that I would have liked to have seen, that I would have added in the model, and, and that's the percentage of um, people on your team who have darker skin, because um, it's, it's not even one of the covariates. Um, so this sense of what we choose as covariates is really important, and it's good to standardize things. So, and this was mentioned earlier um, by Bob Cox. Uh, think carefully about the assumptions that you're making when designing, analyzing, and reporting um, the study. So there's there's a lot of different assumptions that we go in that go into the models that we use, the the designs of our study, and um, I'm going to show you an example now of of one in which um, this is my own work, which is good news and, and bad news. The good news was trying to challenge one of the assumptions of um, one of the standard assumptions. The bad news is I made a bias, um, a analytic bias error that came out, and which is also an important point, is that um, science is in some sense self-correcting, and that's a good thing. We see that happen. So when I was at Minnesota, I was involved uh, in a uh, review where we were looking at white matter abnormalities in schizophrenia. And at the time, most of the studies, um, and this is actually white matter abnormalities of using DTI. So all the red dots reflect um, different studies, and you can see they're spatially distributed over many different areas of the brain. And many of these studies were um, um, yeah, voxel-based studies. And so if you have a red dot in one area, you're testing the whole brain. That means other areas have no result. And so you've, you've got, you're only looking at the positive findings in these studies. And, but there's a certain assumption when you're looking at white matter. So what is white matter? Well, white matter is the high-speed communication between different regions. So if you have disruptions in white matter, that'd be like having disruptions in um, traffic flow between different regions. Um, sometimes things flow very smoothly, sometimes you have. And when you think about um, our assumption when we use voxel-based approaches is that the overlapping regions, um, so if you are, you're overlapping all the voxels and you're doing a statistics uh, spatially uh, expecting that some spatial overlap in the signals. And that's an assumption that we have. So it's almost like saying, let's take all these beltways of um, different regions. We're going to overlap them and we're going to see if the traffic jams are all the same in all those areas. But you could have traffic jams in different areas, but they could have essentially the same effect on, um, yeah, the functional activity of, a, of, a, of getting to work, let's say, that's your, and, and I chose different cities. I think Minnesota, Rotterdam, London, and, but in essence, we, we put everything in standard space. So I said, what if we were to come up with uh, some mechanism to um, 
to look at non-spatially specific white matter regions by um, taking all your areas. A is taking everything in, um, in, in standard space, and then you create a group and standard deviation image. You then Z-transform all those images. You mask them so you get just white matter. And then you look for these based on the, the overall mean, are there areas which have these potholes or white matter areas which are go downs that are more spatially, um, um, individually tailored and, and spatially specific. And so um, we did this and, um, and we found um, between patients and controls, um, there was a significant difference irrespective of your minimal voxel cluster size. But in the analysis, in the, in the design, in the, in the mathematics of this, there, there was a bias, and that was reported. And um, I had to deal with, um, so it's um, with that, so potholes and moleholes, bias. And there's been a couple papers that came out. And those have been corrected, and there are other methods used um, using this kind of same approach. Um, but this analytic bias that, that can happen, and also, the self-correction, but it's also um, challenging a certain assumptions in the literature. And there's, there's other examples of analytic bias that over time they get worked out. So tip number eight is establish fixed pre-processing and processing pipelines if possible. And, and going back to the Ioannidis paper, so the greater the flexibility in designs, definitions, outcomes, and analytic models in the scientific field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. And we, partly because we have this push for positive findings, um, and, and there's so many, if you think of in and, and, and the earlier talks, all the different possibilities from, uh, um, I just went backwards, no, all, to, all the different possibilities for different analytic process, processes. So time shifting, motion correction, linear versus nonlinear registrations, differences in brain templates. If you were to go through and calculate the, the number of different pathways, the, um, how many different options that you have, it's, it's huge. And one of these ways is going to give you a positive finding if, if that's your goal. And so if you can fix, um, pre-processing process and pipelines and then deviate um, from those um, with certain justifications, I think it will help this. Um, and then use provenance algorithms um, to document your data processing. So tip number seven in the top 10 tips for good reporting. Um, in the statistical models um, methods, just make clear what, what your variables are, dependent, independent models, inference testing. Consider analyses that make fewer assumptions about the data while still providing the needed inference, such as perhaps bootstrapping and, and permutation methods. Um, provide the rationale for the choice or lack of. There's, there's certain cases where you may not want to do um, multiple testing, but in most cases, um, um, it's true, so which, what are you choosing and, and why are you choosing that? Um, and there was a paper in 2012 showing that only 59% of fMRI studies are corrected for multiple testing. I think that's changed. I think, um, um, and that's one of the key points of the, of the COBITIS document is, is really you need to account for multiple testing and then um, describe the rationale for that. So if possible, um, perform a replication in your study. And not everyone can do that. It depends on the sample size. I work with currently in Rotterdam in the large population-based study of child development. And um, so um, with large sample size, you, you can do this within your, your study. And we have an example of that um, in which actually for 2016, we have the HBM award for best paper, which I'll show you here. So um, <clears throat> what we did is we looked at resting state networks in, in school-aged children. And um, we did a bootstrapping approach where um, we extracted 50, we had um, about 500 uh, samples of resting state networks in children. And we pulled out 50 and we ran um, ICA and then we used a, a, a 
variation of a dice coefficient to see which networks were there. Um, and then we threw them back in and, and did it again. And um, we looked at the stability of resting state networks. And um, we also looked at, um, we also presented not only the, the typical resting state networks, but we also showed noise networks, which are in the lighter gray. And then these are networks we're not, we're not sure what they are. Um, could be noise, you know, when you look at the frequency spectrum versus the spatial characteristics, it's not completely clear. But th there's good news that like the auditory, the default mode network, um, parietal, uh, visual, uh, right, uh, many networks are, are very robust out of um, almost 100% um, of the time, 100% or almost 100%, they're always there. There are some networks, like the, the sensory network, that was much less stable. And um, there was also noise networks that are highly consistent, usually the flow artifacts, um, but other ones are there. So, um, and the, the data, we actually, did, this is work of uh, Ryan Metzel, who actually worked a lot to get, to run all these analyses and, um, get all these done, but these are all um, freely available um, to, to download in, through Nitric. So this is really um, actually very important. Provide enough information that your study could be both reproduced and replicated. Reproducibility, um, and we, we went through on the COBIDIS document, what is reproducibility? What is replication? What does it mean? Um, I mean, if with, what is, um, I mean, for example, test-retest reliability, there's, there's a nice figure. You could have it done within the same session, or you could have them come back a week later, and, and what does that mean? But reproducibility, in essence, is an investigator independently obtains the same results with the same data. That's like the soccer um, example. Um, and, rep and replication is a different investigator independently obtains similar results with different data. And people have probably heard about the, this was first came out as the voodoo correlations, but one of the things they brought up in this paper was the high correlations are all the m more puzzling because the methods sections rarely contain much detail about how the correlations were obtained. And then, more recently, the um, estimating the reproducibility uh, of psychological science in the Open Science Collaboration, in which um, um, I think 39% of um, papers were, um, were reproduced, um, looking closely at 100 different papers. But they also reported potentially problematic practices include selective reporting, selective analysis and insuffic insufficient specifications of the conditions um, necessary to, to obtain the results. And this is, I think, one of the main points of the COBITIS document is just describe what you do so that other people can understand. They can make, come up with their own decisions because we're not um, going to define how you, we're going to define best practices of reporting, but there's so much variability in how people um, of the data itself and how you analyze the data. And here's, um, here's the open science collaboration, the actual data, data which I find um, kind of um, shocking in some, in some respects that you take 100 papers and only 39% are replications. So the effect sizes were on the order of half. But this is a, a graph showing um, the replication effect size on the y-axis and the original effect size on the x-axis. And, um, and then the, the red, uh, blue is significant and red is non-significant. You can see the differences. Um, um. So data sharing, so um, I think this is a, a large push, especially I was just at the hackathon, and um, it's one of the main um, pushes of, of open science, the open science SIG. Make your data available for other researchers to use. If it's, if it's available, then, then people can go in and look and, and um, rerun the analyses or run different analyses and try to understand more aspects of, of the results that you do get or don't get. 
But it's best to think about data sharing before you start your study. Um, I'm actually, I mentioned in a large population-based study um, in child development, I interact a lot with epidemiologists who are less willing, um, I think are less willing to share data. It's not as much in the culture um, as in the neuroimaging um, or the emerging neuroimaging culture. Um, but it's, it's best to, when you're writing your IRB, when you're writing your metho medical ethics, put in um, statements for consent. And I, I think for, for the US um, and Canadian side, this with the NIH funding and requirements of, of data sharing, this is moving that way. So, um, and then put funding to support data sharing in your grant. We were part of the MIND research network and we were sharing data and it's actually quite a bit of work um, and, and to get to be involved in data sharing and I think that's one of the obstacles um, in data sharing is that there's so much work. But if you think about data sharing um, from the perspective of um, three different groups, you have researchers, you have funding agencies, and you have the public. So if you think about it from the public perspective, as long as you keep things confidential, um, data is de-identified, there should be, I think, the general consensus is from the public, they're gonna be very much in favor of shared data. And funding agencies get more for their money through data sharing, having it accessible, more transparency, um, it's the researchers, it's us who, um, who have the most to either gain or to lose through data sharing. I'll argue that we have much to gain through data sharing. Um, we can address research questions not possible with um, data from a single lab. Um, if there's some mechanism of credit, like data paper citations, that would be really helpful for data sharing um, and recognition from data sharing. But um, the drawback is you, you also, and this I hear in, in, in the group, people, my collaborators that I work with, that you spend a lot of time collecting the data and then you wanna, act, you wanna publish with the data and have time. So that can be done with like um, grace periods where you, where you have time to analyze your data. Um, before the data is released. And I know that's currently being done with things like the ABCD study. But there's a lot of open data and um, open platforms and, and, and in essence, um, this fear that if I make my data public, then other people are gonna use it and I won't get credit for it, I mean, a lot of the open source uh, data, software, and, and all that is, is really driving the field. So um, I had a few kind of posters, um, which when I was involved in a, um, a data sharing organization in Leiden, um, that open, that sharing also helps um, developing countries that might not have the resources to collect the data, but they, they can, they have, networks and they can use their um, resources to yeah, look at data in, in different ways. So tip number two is if your study design and analyses are solid and you obtain a negative result, then publish a negative paper. I know it's hard. Um, make sure that a power analysis is included. So I was looking at my data, my papers. Um, so how many positive, what's my relationship to positive versus negative findings? And it's, I have a ratio of nine to one. So does that mean that nine of my hypotheses, I, I'm very good in choosing hypotheses that are correct, um, or I don't publish negative findings? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, if, if, but I can say if you're always getting, if you're not publishing any negative findings, then what does that mean? Um, yeah, I, I think in, and tip number one, be transparent. No study is perfect. I've shown you um, my successes and some, and some errors. Um, no study is perfect, just be transparent in what you do, put it out there, and then the readers can make a decision on 
different aspects of bias or, um, or the findings. Okay, I thank all the people in uh, funding agencies and students, and I, and then I'll. I think it. I think probably now. Um, Now, I'm, I'm done with my talk, but probably we could just take questions as an entire group up here now, or I can take specific questions, but. Yeah, okay, any specific questions about the COBITIS document or data sharing or anything in that? Hi, thank you for those tips. Uh, you mentioned briefly that there might be some sort of um, sourcing the original study or one of the benefits for the funders is that they then have the research going further. And I was wondering if maybe you could speak a little bit about some ideas of how this would work in terms of the open platform, whether or not you, you still, if you were to publish someone else's collected data, reference the source that paid for it and how you might go about referencing that lab that collected it. Um, so, if I understand the, um, the question correctly, is um, if, you, if you share data, so, and there's groups that, that share quite, I mean, the Human Connect Home Project is sharing, um, the NYU are sharing, there's the Abide Data Consortium and that, and usually what they do is write um, a data paper that is um, cited. So one way um, would to get credit for that would be to have a, like a, an S index, a sharing index for different groups where, um, where if you're involved in open access data sharing, there's some way to get credit for that data sharing. That's one point I think, is that cover one point? And the other point is um, that's giving credit to the lab for the, usually data sharing can be more labs, but um, the other is um, I think you should cite where the data came from. If you're, if you're trying to replicate a study, just that should go in your paper that you're trying to replicate a study and where the data is coming from. And those are usually linked in different things. And th there's been some recent examples of actually papers that are completely open. You can go and access the data. You can run the analyses um, kind of in open format in order to reproduce the results. I've, I haven't done that. That would, it seems, I'm not actually sure how much effort that took. It'd be an important question to know. Discussion period. Okay. So we stay. Yeah. So we, yeah, so we have a discussion speaking. period now, and so I'd like to ask all the speakers um, from this morning who are here if you could come up. <laughs> it would be fabulous, and we'd like to have a, a, you know, a chance to kind of reflect on the morning and and have a, a broader discussion. So come on up, and this is a good chance to ask any other questions. So don't be shy. About asking. Hey, yeah, um, see if these are on. <laughs> yes, maybe. Yeah, we, we built in time for these discussion periods um, because I think a lot of times people don't, they listen to the talks, don't necessarily feel like you can sort of explore an issue uh, and raise it. So we kind of built in these times this year uh, to let people do that. Um, so if, yeah, if you have a, a question or discussion point, come on up. Um, if the panelists also have points then, uh, or, or things to discuss, then you can go for it and raise them.
room is too small. The room is too small. <laughs> How can we get a bigger room? <laughs> yeah. Uh, when Tanya was talking, it reminded me of something that's been around in the computing literature for a while, and that's the idea of the self-executing paper. That is, a paper that comes with uh, data and scripts so that you can reproduce its results. That doesn't mean they're right. They may be wrong or they may be understated, overstated, who knows, but at least you can say, oh, okay, they did this, this you can execute it and say eh, 4.7. <laughs> so, and they got 4.7, so then, the, now this is a very difficult thing to do, uh, especially in fMRI where there's a lot of data, and then the scripts, it's not just one script that executes all of, all of it because you have s scripts for the uh, pre-processing and then s scripts to do the, the group analysis and then probably uh, other scripts to produce figures and so on. And so to do all of that, it package all of that up, is a tremendous amount of effort to organize it so that someone else can understand it because probably you don't really understand all of it at any one point, even if you did all of it, especially, and if it was distributed among a bunch of postdocs and graduate students, then nobody <laughs> really has got, got it. But even an attempt to do this is, is worth something, I think. It's a, a, a lot better than just sharing the data and say, here, go ahead. Because the, the, uh, the script, the, the, the d data is one thing, and processing it is, you know, a, 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 just a big thing. And, and an example that people, we, we, a very specific example that we saw in resting state analysis a few years ago is that people do band passing of the data sometimes and then they filter it in other ways, motion regression or something. And the, the thing is they never, they wouldn't specify how they did this. They'd just say we did A, then B, then C. But they do them simultaneously or not. But in the case of band passing followed by motion parameter regression, the order in which you do those, one, then two, two, then one, or one and two together will give you different results, seriously different results. And people never specified this. If you had the script, you'd know. But people didn't specify it because they didn't know, which is another thing of getting back to my plea, is someone should understand what you're doing. <laughs> a little, at least, a little, please. <laughs> is, there, is there a related comment or question back there? I walked in late, so I don't know if it's related, but I had a question for Dr. Cox. Um, I was hoping, in the description of your talk, it mentioned that you might talk about um, the challenges that come in pre-processing with short TRs. Do you have anything to say on that? Uh, yes, I, but I, I didn't, there were a lot, a lot of things that uh, didn't make it into my talk because of lack of time, both on preparation and lack of time in 30 minutes. But uh, sh very short TR stuff, as Larry Wall demonstrated, you can clearly see, see I mean, if you look at the time series as opposed to the power sp uh, spectrum, the, uh, you can very clearly see the heartbeat and respiration. I mean, it just goes up and down and up and down. It's a very dominant feature. If resting state stuff at that, like that, is, I mean, it, it's the most obvious thing. If you have a TR of uh, 0.2 seconds, you, I mean, you look at it and you say, what the heck is this stuff that's going up and down real smooth? And you say, wait a minute, that's about a second apart. <laughs> then it's obvious. Uh, and so, but then, if you're going to process that, I mean, that is, the simple models that are used for time series uh, statistics, uh, like AR or ARMA models, aren't going aren't to work because the, 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 the data, the, the fluctuations in the data that are of no real interest, uh, the rubbish, the noise, uh, are more complex. That, and we, we, we don't see that with TR as two seconds. It's a lot, it's lost there. That's, so uh, that, that, there is a simple example of, of something that can be done, uh, something that has to be done. Uh, I think Gary has a, maybe uh, a lot of thoughts about this too. You've been writing about this for, for a while, Gary. Years. Yeah, a lot of people have been um, enamored of the better statistics that apparently you get with, um, with the short TR acquisitions. And people, um, 
as Bob just said, often apply the wrong statistics to this. That is, um, you end up with out taking into account the temporal, um, serial temporal correlations. And so the statistics um, are often inflated and you think you're getting really awesome Z or T scores when in fact um, most of those uh, measurements are not um, independent. And so you have to be really careful when you draw inferences about um, something with a TR of 0.1 or 0.2 seconds. Um, you're getting hundreds of data points where you used to get tens of data points for the same amount of time. And you just have to be careful that you apply the proper statistics um, to, to uh, understanding what those seemingly separate measurements give you. So the early results, and there are lots of classical examples of getting Z scores or T scores of 30 or 40 or 50 and saying, aha, I really have improved my um, statistical inference. You have to be pretty careful about that. Um, with respect to the, the what Bob was just talking about with physiological um, information, in fact, um, cardiac and respiratory signals are not very sinusoidal. Um, and so you get second and third and fourth order harmonics that with a TR of 250 or 300 milliseconds, you'll miss. And so if you think you are um, properly denoising by simply doing a bandpass filtering at say 0.2 or 0.3 or whatever hertz, um, you uh, in a very rapid time series, um, you may actually be aliasing in quite a bit of energy that we're finding um, from the higher order harmonics in those physiological signals. So you have to be a little careful um, that you think you've totally removed those signals, but in fact you haven't, um, even by doing a, a rapid acquisition and bandpass filtering the first or even the second harmonic. So um, I, I think a little caution has to be has to be applied to the very rapid acquisitions. So in, in my lab, um, like many labs, I think now we've put a lot of um, stock in trying to go fast and have a, we have a TR usually around 400 milliseconds now. Um, and one of the ideas behind that is that it, it'll reduce, um, you know, allow you to do more band fast filtering of noise. Uh, and I, I guess the question, one question is, does that really actually improve uh, group statistics for, for many people, <laughs> right, and have people compared? So we did a comparison in 90 people, uh, some of whom have a multi-band and, and some of them who don't, different, different people, right? Um, and it was actually really quite uh, comparable for us at the end of the day in terms of a group statistics. So I guess I'm wondering what other people's um, experiences are with, with that. <laughs> Can't speak with experience, but that's that's kind of what you'd expect. That, that in fact, intersubject variability is generally much larger than intrasubject variability. So that even if you measured your processing was in some sense perfect on each individual subject, you would it may not actually improve your group statistics that much. Uh, another thing that I, I I'd th I've thought about. Uh, that slipped my mind in my previous ranting was that uh, the we were, Gary and I were talking about the noise, but the uh, uh, the other side is the signal. The signal model will have to be a little more complicated because right now with TR say two seconds, whole brain, you know, the signal goes up and the signal goes down, and we use a pretty simple model for that because it goes up uh, to a brief stimulus. We have like three data points or four data points in the up and down part. We can't. You can't fit a complicated single model with four data points. Uh, but if you had 40 data points in there, then the, 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 you, can't, you, you may want to fit a more intricate model to a, a shape model. Uh, uh, otherwise, you'd be leaving signal on the table, so to speak. And I think with, um, with the advent of much more efficient acquisitions and, and faster TRs, exactly what Bob said, is that people are gonna find that the HRF is not the same in various parts of the brain, and the ability to, um, to, uh, to look at, a, at these rapid acquisitions may give you more information about variability. Um, we've seen, for example, that 
Um, just the uh, hemodynamic delay can be substantial between uh, various parts of the brain, but the shape will also change as, as Banditini and others have shown. So that um, I think the, the simple assumptions that people are making now is that the canonical HRF is perfect for the entire brain um, is going to soon be found to be um, not a very good model, and people are going to look, start looking at uh, much more complicated ways of, of uh, modeling the, the data across the brain. Yeah, you know, maybe I could sort of underscore that point because I, th I think a, a number of people over the years have done work on, on modeling HRF shapes, and there's actually quite some quite good things you can do. But I think one of the limitations has been that um, in small samples, uh, power is relatively low. So if you try to model a more complicated shape, then you pay the price in terms of um, efficiency and power. Uh, if if the model, if the canonical model is okay, <laughs> um, but I think what's going to happen now is is two things. One is w as people start to analyze larger and larger data sets, the added value of a more precise hemodynamic model is going to go up because there's going to be lots of power, and we're going to care more about about getting it right for every brain region. And then number two, I think one thing that can really sort of come, um, you know, into Vogue really for the, the first time, I think, in a, in a broad way, is actually modeling latencies um, and, and, and changes in shape, you know, with that additional power. So I think that's a high growth area. Uh, well, thank you all for the very interesting talks. Um, I had a bit more of a general question. Uh, speaking of these advanced methods and um, analysis, these sorts of issues, how much do you think this is influenced by the choice of experimental task uh, in terms of the analysis, in terms of the type of uh, analysis you can do, and some of the bad press that MRI research has gotten? How much do you think the actual experiment has to do with that? Are you asking how or which methods to choose relative to a certain scientific question? Um, in a way, I, I guess it's more to do with we talk a lot about how can we advance the type of analysis we can do, but obviously it's not all suited to the same type of experimental design. A lot of it works when you have checkerboards uh, or a simple visual stimulus, but how do we also cope with more advanced experimental designs like a, a complex conditioning paradigm? Um, how do we reconcile using the most advanced analyses with also complex experiments? Uh. Right. Maybe I'll respond in terms of uh, fMRI data acquisition. Um, like in which, you know, when you, when you present the scientific question, you need to ask yourself first, do I want to look at the entire brain? This already imposes some limitations on the spatial resolutions that you can get on the TR, etc. Or do I want to focus on a small part of the brain and really image at high resolution and try to get to the level of cortical columns or cortical layers? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So that's uh, the very first uh, a question that uh, you need to ask yourself. Then, uh, in terms of uh, uh, data analysis, um, <coughs> you know, I'm, I'm uh, I like the approach of looking at various data analysis uh, ways to ask or to, to sort of try to answer one question. For example, you can do the bread and butter general linear model, or you can do decoding, which shows that you are able to decode various uh, conditions that you may be interested in, which means that your data has the information that allows you to decode it. It's there in the data uh, in the functional architecture. <coughs> and maybe Tor can take from here. 
I could say drop about um, experimental design. I, I think is is really critical, and in general, it can have a, a huge impact. Of course, um, I'll just say one thing. What I think is is one of the sort of most overlooked ideas about how experimental <laughs> design can impact replicability and reproducibility is even if you have a, a really good design, an optimized design, let's say. Um, you're still usually in a study only testing sort of one very narrow slice, right? One one particular design. And in some studies, even some very large studies, like with the ABCD study, 10,000 people, there was a lot of discussion about whether to use the exact same timing, a sequence of trials where the timing is fixed across every uh, individual in the 10,000 person sample. Um, and while there are arguments why that would be okay, or good or, or desirable from an, an individual difference perspective, in terms of um, generalizability and reproducibility, that's actually uh, not a good idea because then what you're imaging is, with very high power is one exact sequence of trials in one task. And if you change the sequence of trials to another sort of random set of event timing and so on, you're gonna get a different answer. How different, we don't know, <laughs> right? So one of the, the basic principles, I think, um, that we'll talk about a little bit this afternoon is if you want to design a study to extract general features and generalize o o o you know, to, to some task uh, broadly, then you, you want to build in variation in your design. So if you're studying inhibition, ideally you'd like to build in variation across different kinds of inhibition with different stimuli and different timings and, and so forth. And that actually gives you a better opportunity to, to extract something that's generalizable. So that's just one of many kind of aspects. <laughs> I'll say something um, as well. The, the more complex um, your paradigm, your analyses are, um, the more difficult it is um, to understand or to, to model, to understand the power. And if um, power is lower, then it's more likely that you're getting uh, false positives. Um, so it, I, I would say the, the planning um, ahead, depending on what your specific hypothesis is and making decisions on the complexity, if you can keep it um, simple or more straightforward or building it, um, building it on more simple models until you reach your complex model, that might be one approach to take. Okay, so I, I have to ask this question um, mainly for Gary uh, and anyone else who wants to comment too, but um, I found that the uh, potential for deep non-invasive neurostimulation to be really profound. Um, I'm thinking about the cell paper that you talked about. And if you can put electrodes on somebody's head and create some kind of resonant electrical frequency across the two that lines up and then actually produces deep brain stimulation without going into the skull, you know, this has you know, huge growth potential and implications, right? Uh, one really simple question is, I guess, <laughs> you know, they did that in mice, think you can even do it in, in humans. Right, that particular thing, right? Because the heads are you know, a lot bigger. <laughs> yeah, it's a cute paper because they did the experiment in, in rodents, um, but they show pictures of human brains. And um, the implication is that all is perfect in human brains. And what we're finding um, is that, in fact, currents don't actually go in nice little paths between one electrode and another, um, just as you model with a nice uniform um, complex conductivity that um, doesn't have a lot of features in it. But it turns out that it looks like the currents are going along sulci um, where there's nice ionic conductivity in the CSF that is much higher than in the tissue. So you don't have a nice banana that connects to, to electrodes. What you have is a jagged thing that goes along wherever, the, whoops, wherever most of the CSF is. And um, maybe that will make a big difference in terms of, of um, whether you can actually get a signal in the deep brain or not um, in a thing as large as a human head as opposed to a, a rodent head. So um, I think the jury's out. I, I agree with what Tor said, that if this could actually work, um, where you can electrically stimulate quite deep regions of the brain, that's something that 
Uh, TMS doesn't do very well because the magnetic field um, broadens out as you go down. And, um, and if you can really focus by this temporal interference, especially when um, it kind of requires a nonlinear interaction in order to see an actual frequency that's present at, um, at 10 hertz or 1 hertz or whatever, um, that's, that's a really interesting concept. So I think a lot of, I think this paper will stimulate a lot of interest, and in fact it stimulated ours a lot. We had already started looking at multi-channel uh, different frequency and different amplitude modulation of um, TDCS and TACS, well mostly TACS. Um, but I think the multi-channel um, experimental apparatus makes uh, an interesting um, playground for um, for um, deep brain stimulation. Um, tricky to do currently with TMS. Um, more easily done with focused ultrasound because you can, you can actually stimulate quite deeply, um, but people don't understand the mechanism very well right now. And um, aberrations through the skull make it a little difficult with, with focused ultrasound. I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but that's another um, possibly quite interesting deep brain modulatory technique. So um, we'll see. I think, I think it's not so simple as this paper makes out to be, um, and it may not, may not work very well uh, deeply, but uh, in any case, um, it does allow you to shift things around in a controlled fashion, and that's pretty powerful. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. It's not related to that, but we have a follow up. That's fine. I said it wasn't related to what you were just talking about, so if you had a comment on that, go ahead. That's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wondered about the idea that um, fMRI is supposed to be kind of representing more the input to an area. Right, so that's kind of been out there for a while, but I don't feel like it's really changed the way that people think about fMRI, right? So then we report results and sort of this typical let's find the blob idea, right? Then they attribute sort of that action or whatever is being modulated to that region, right? And really that's implying that it's whoever is feeding into it. So I wondered sort of what you thought about, you know, how significant and how people should try to re think how they think about those things, particularly also with, rest, with resting state functional connectivity. I actually don't think that people should change the way they think. In this morning's lecture, I did present the results by Dr. Logotetis, but I emphasized that an input to any neuron is not only input that is of origin in other areas. It's not an input to an area. It can be also input from neurons that are 50 micron away. And in fact, 80% of all the synapses that impinge on any single neuron in cerebral cortex are with origin of half, half a millimeter around this area. So while we try to do our best to uh, say, you know, things like fMRI represents synaptic activity more than action potentials, fMRI represents input to an area, et cetera, et cetera. If you notice that my take home message is that in really the majority of the studies, the real majority of studies, we need to think about fMRI as representing the overall neuronal activity within the voxel. I think that trying to do anything beyond that uh, is fits possibly 0.1% of paradigms that we look at. It's difficult to do with functional MRI, especially in the cerebral cortex, where everything is connected to everything. In every single cortical column, if we have an electrode orthogonal to the cortical surface, Cortical layers are so much connected between, between themselves that increasing connectivity in, in the increasing activity in any cortical layer immediately is propagating throughout the column, perhaps except for layer six. Uh, so my recommendation is 
uh, to steal with functional MRI, and especially if we talk about three Tesla, but even with seven Tesla, um, it's very difficult to make interpretation beyond uh, just functional MRI represent the overall activity uh, within the voxel. That's my take home message on that. I was going to ask about uh, reproducibility and kind of a basic question, but what do you think uh, replication is? Are we, are, is our goal to replicate p-values or effect sizes, similar patterns of results, and just kind of get some feedback on that? Uh, I, I don't think there's any, any one answer. I, I think, um, I think p-values p would be a bit dangerous. Um, or not dangerous, if you, significance, because you can be just above significance or just below significance. So, so choosing a threshold is probably not the best way uh, to see if something replicates. But looking more at uh, the effect estimates, the, the spatial locations, um, and I think with all the different um, potential uh, combinations of ways to, um, to analyze your data, um, I mean, if you're talking about replication, uh, the, the most stable findings should be platform independent, should be analysis independent. Um, I mean, those, if you're looking at, um, for example, I think of uh, studies that, that we've done, what are the effects of um, low folate uh, during pregnancy and downstream effects on brain development. So you would hope that those would replicate um, irrespective of um, the different types of platforms or analysis strategies that you use. Um, now I'm coming, did you say reproducibility of replication? I'm sorry. What should we be reproducing right? or replicating? Because, yeah, yeah. yeah, replication right. is different. Then reproducibility yeah. um, comes back to really using people's own data to come up and their analysis strategies to come up with the same results that they, that they had. And I think showing like the Open Science um, Consortium, they, they showed both, um, you know, is it significant or not? And they also showed what are the differences in the effect estimates. And I think showing effect estimates um, shows you the variability of the finding. And one idea to quickly follow up on this is we shouldn't be reproducing people's experiments exactly, but their conclusions. <laughs> Right. I mean, you want to be able to know that you can, you can, you know, do something over and over again, and, and it'll work. <laughs> you know. So I'm very utilitarian in that way. We want to know what we what we should believe at the end of the day is what this is all about. <laughs> um, I have a, a follow up question about uh, bold physiology, and um, it it has to do with. Um, you know, so, so some work by uh, Tori Vasquez and Sanji Kim, I believe, has, has shown that if you optogenetically stimulate inhibitory interneurons, you also get bold increases, <laughs> which is an, one nice demonstration. So I, so I guess, you know, what about, um, what about uh, high field imaging of, of different cortical layers? So I think some people think that that might give you some leverage into saying, you know, de deciding what's a kind of inhibitory uh, activity and what's excitatory. <laughs> Well, I would, I would separate, or I'll allow myself to split your question into two parts. The, the first part is about optogenetic stimulation of inhibitory neurons. And that's, actually, I presented a slide on that today from Anna DeVos' uh, laboratory. And what the results from Anna DeVos show is that uh, you get first a phase, a transient phase of increase in bold signal. But a, or actually, in their case, it was the a dilation or a constriction of arterioles. So you get first a dilation of arterioles after optogenetic stimulation of inhibitory neurons. But then it is followed by a long and quite significant constriction. Okay. So now, no, no matter what, it's not news that inhibitory neurons require energy and 
you know, require oxygen and glucose to function. However, one thing that we need to take into account is what is their effect, the overall effect on the network. And inhibitor neurons impinge their synapses on pyramidal cells in very strategic locations. So most of them have a synapses right at the soma or even at the soma heloc. So their effect uh, is very strong. Uh, although we have in cerebral cortex only about 20% of the neurons are inhibitory, they have a very strong effect on the overall activity in each location simply because they are, they are their effect or their synapses impinge on very strategic locations in terms of the production of action potentials in terms of pyramidal cells. Uh, another thing to uh, consider is that, at least in my studies, I'm very careful not to mention that negative bold is equal inhibition. What I'm saying is that negative bold in the paradigms that I used uh, was associated with decreases in neuronal activity, which could be also decrease in input to an area, not necessarily active inhibition within the area. It's actually very difficult, except for now with optogenetics uh, techniques, it's very difficult to dissociate decrease in input, tonic input or excitatory input, than local inhibition. Uh, even if you go to recording, intracellular recording from a neuron, even then it's difficult. Uh, so the only way is that I think it can be done is via a causal manipulation such as with optogenetics. Now, the second part of your question has to do with uh, imaging of cortical layers. I allowed myself to split between the two because I think that they are orthogonal. The reason is that in every cortical layers, you have both pyramidal cells or excitatory cells, and you have also inhibitory neurons. So these are two different questions. Uh, now, uh, in my view, imaging cortical layers is difficult. It's much more difficult than imaging cortical columns. Um, I strongly believe that functional MRI at seven Tesla and higher and especially with a recent method of uh, improved RF, and um, like we are at the level of imaging cortical columns. Um, there are papers going back to the beginning of the 2000, uh, and then throughout the 2000 un until now, of imaging cortical columns with very high uh, reliability I believe I see Dr. Menon here. Uh, you know, he published a couple of papers on that. And so I believe that functional MRI at seven Tesla and higher is capable of imaging cortical columns. Um, definitely cortical columns that whose cycle, cortical cycle is two millimeter, about two millimeter, like ocular dominance columns. So I'm, I'm involved in imaging cortical columns, very highly reproducible fit exactly what we know about the monkey visual cortex and how they are organized. Uh, so I'm very strong believer in that, except for maybe orientation columns that are harder to get. Any other columns in the visual cortex or somatosensory cortex that we know of from the monkey model have lower spatial or a longer spatial cycle, lower spatial frequency on cortex, which means that in my view, functional MRI at seven Tesla and higher is capable of imaging now uh, the majority of columnar organizations uh, in the cerebral cortex. In contrast, I believe, well, I'm, I'm, I'm making efforts myself and I strongly believe that we should continue making efforts because it's a very important question. But I believe that laminar specific imaging is difficult. There are uh, several reasons why it is. One of the main ones is that it's difficult to find paradigms that actually get you uh, responses in specific cortical layers. And if you think you have a paradigm like that, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, cortical layers are interconnected 
very much. You, if one layer increases its activity, it immediately propagates everywhere within the same column. So it is difficult to image uh, cortical layers. Another reason is that a part of the veins from which, of the venules from which we get our data uh, are, are organized in a manner which is orthogonal to the cortical uh, manifold, which means that they actually smear, they smooth any activity across cortical layers. So that's another difficulty. Um, and I'll stop here. So I think that uh, we are at an era in which it's difficult, but it is doable to image cortical columns. It still remains difficult and challenging to image cortical layers, functionally. I'm sure that many of us would like to just press on through lunch, uh, but I think we should give our speakers a rest. And uh, so we're going to pause for lunch and uh, regroup at 1 o'clock sharp. Thank you. Mm -hmm.